just um, one bit of work which is um, we've certainly been working away at for a couple of years and that's basically canola's need for sulphur. Um, canola's need for sulphur is, is quite a distinguishing feature, like it sets it out aside from any other crop that we grow. It's pretty well the only one that we actively fertilise for sulphur. So even chickpeas and fibres and that we don't actively put sulphur on, it's generally just MAP or DAP with the traces that it's got. So there are recommendations around sulphur nutrition and it is pretty well adopted. Certainly very well adopted across our red soils. Our grey soils of the region probably is probably not so accepted, but in the red, red soil it is. We started looking at sulphur nutrition in canola about three years ago. We were looking at it in terms of oil percentage and trying to put some light to why we seem to struggle to get oil. That's where we started, but it sort of morphed over time. But after three years of trial work and nearly 20 trials, um, mostly by us, but in the last 12 months, there's been a couple of other agencies like DPI have run a few trials um, last year and um, NGA and Central West Farming Systems and the like. Basically after three years we've got no response in yield or oil percentage to the addition of sulphur. So we really haven't got a response to sulphur to the addition, uh, a response in yield or oil to the addition of sulphur. So what, uh, what is the current recommended practice? This is from the 2009 management guide. And it states all paddock sown to canola should receive 20 kilos of sulphur as sulphate, so available sulphur. On soils that are lighter or had deficiencies, you can even look at going even higher than that again. But my point is, is all paddocks and 20 kilos, okay? That has been repeated almost verbatim through just about every canola resource that I've had a look at um, in the last three years, you know, whilst I've been having a look at it. So it's a pretty consistent message. So what's the basis of this recommendation? Well, certainly the current work that we've done certainly wouldn't support it, but it came from somewhere. In the late 80s and 90s, they identified sulphur deficiency in canola, and they showed that it was rectified and rectified well by, with the addition of sulphur. So it's certainly identified, and on the back of that, in 92, they, um, there was 14 trials established in collaboration with CSIRO, UNE, uh, Instatec Pivot of the Day, whatever they were called, and DPI. Now those trials, promoted as giving dramatic responses, which, which were true, don't get me wrong. So there was headlines that came out of it as yield penalties up to 80%. It talked about you know some answer to unreliability of canola and, and also periodic crop failures. Out of that work there, the, the, the recommendation was born. So that recommendation that I just read out, out to you came from those 90 trials in 92. The adoption on it was pretty rapid. They reckon 80% of growers in that first year or even before the completion of those trials were putting that extra sulphur on probably because of, you know, the, the dramatic responses that we're seeing in some of those trial sites, okay? Sulphur at that stage was a lot cheaper than what we're paying today, relatively speaking. And also canola prices were high relative to cost. It was more profitable to grow then than what it is now. We're paying twice as much for our fertiliser, diesel, machinery, labour, land and everything else. So things have changed a little bit. However, that recommendation's been pretty well unchanged or unchallenged in nearly 20 years. So what was it? So this is Wellington here. The pale plots in there were the sulphur deficient plot or the non-sulphur plots, okay? So it's quite distinct and quite stark. But when you actually go back and have a look at those trials and look at all the reports out of the 14 sites, only six of them actually responded, okay? So not all of them, not the majority of them, six of them. Many of the sites that were predicted to respond didn't respond and some that were predicted not to respond did respond. Only two of them out of the six were really big. One at, at Wellington, which is the one in the back, and Peter might, he'd probably fill you in more of the details that I could do. The second biggest one was actually at Barradine. And interestingly, when you look at the trial report, it's reported that sitting on nearly 700 kilos of sulphur, assumably gypsum. So there's no shortage of gyp sulphur in that system. I guess the question to me is why wasn't that crop tapping into it? I don't know, there's not enough detail around those trial reports, but it's, it did respond in a tonne, tonne and a half or something rather like that. It was a significant response. The other four, I'm not saying they didn't respond or, the, or it was not economic or statistically sound. My point is, is just, it just wasn't a catastrophic failure as it was at Pete's. Like it was a three, nearly four tonne crop, dropped back to a tonne, like huge penalty, huge penalty. The rest of them were probably no different to what we might see when we're just a bit nitrogen deficient in the paddy. There was a penalty attached to it, but not catastrophic failure. So um, 
I'm not saying that it, it wasn't, uh, you know, considered worthy or anything like that, just not catastrophic. So given that, when you consider sulphur deficiency, when you look at all the recent trials um, and even the past trials in terms of the frequency, I think it'd be fair to say that the frequency is, is not huge. It's not high. It's not the majority of circumstances. It's more the exception rather than the rule. In terms of severity, yes, there are cases of really severe deficiencies, but it's not always the case. A lot of the situations may simply be there's, there's a loss of yield. It could be addressed, but um, to me, given that it's not always serious and not always the case, can we afford this luxurious approach, this broad brush approach where we just apply sulphur on every single paddock on every single year? Sulphur deficiency can still happen. We haven't been able to find it. It can still happen and it will happen. However, having said that, you can rectify sulphur deficiency in a canola crop. But, you know, when you recognise it, you can rectify it by applying sulphur. So all is not lost. But it can happen in the future, but it's just the frequency that's a, a question. And just to try and put in a little bit of perspective, I, I get you to think about in terms of chronic deficiencies of nitrogen. We've all seen that in every single paddock where we have got, you know, we've lost 50% yield and everything like that. Do we regularly go out there and just put 100 kilos a year on every single wheat paddock, every single year, or canola paddock, just because maybe 10% of them are going to be critically low? We probably don't. We do it in a much more prescriptive manner. And we may have to do that in terms of, you know, the, the cost of production of canola, we probably need to be a little bit wiser about where we spend our money. So it's about improving the predictability of where we do invest in sulphur and where we don't. So of course tools essential for this would certainly be soil testing and nutrient budgeting. I mean they're probably, other than past performance, they would be really good key indicators of, of where you might put it and where you won't. And interestingly, so if we're talking about soil testing, the KCL40 soil test is the standard soil test. So when you send your soil away, that's what it gets tested at. It's actually a pasture test. It was, it was probably adopted around about that same period in the 90s where the sulphur deficiency was uh, re recognised. Might interest you to know that it's actually never been calibrated, or certainly not to a large extent, for canola. Okay? So the figure that comes out of it is just a best guess or an extrapolation. There's no, no great deal of trial work or data behind it that says that, yeah, if it's this, you'll definitely get a response. None of that at all. Um, and in fact, when you talk to some of the agents, like, um, like um, IPL and stuff like that, and some of the other, they can't even tell you where they get the number from. So it's not calibrated in terms of performance. So I'm not saying the test is bunkum, just maybe the figure may need some adjusting or revising. The other thing, nutrient removal, just about everything that you read will quote that 10 kilos of sulphur is removed for every, every tonne of grain that you take out of that paddock. So a two tonne crop, if you're aiming a two tonne crop, 10 kilos per tonne, 20 kilos. Very supportive of that original estimate, okay? The interesting thing is we've tested grain off our trials, other NGA tested grain off their trials, there's plenty of published peer-reviewed research where they tested grain off other trials. There is no, I haven't found any data yet that would support 10 kilos, most of it falls in four to five kilos. So less than half of what's often quoted. So that two tonne crop, instead of needing 20 kilos, is only 10. So it's, it's a lot less than what we thought was going out. So what about the theory that canola needs more sulphur in the wheat? That's also a pretty common call of agronomists, myself included, in, in past lives. You know, justification for putting the extra sulphur on. Let's just accept for the time being that canola yields about half of that a wheat in the same paddy, side by side, about half. So in a one and a half tonne canola crop average across the district, at four kilos per tonne, we're taking off about six kilos per hectare. In the case of wheat, double the yield, removes about two kilos per tonne of grain, six kilos. So actually not taking any more sulphur out of the paddock off a wheat crop than you are canola. But our approach to sulphur nutrition is very much different between the two crops. We're putting hell of a lot more on canola and we're really putting next to nothing on wheat.